The following program is sponsored by the goodwill, prayers, and financial resources of the Heritage Partners. Let the nations see your glory, all the peoples feel your power. Let the nations bow to you, O oh God. something very basic to Christianity. I want to talk about keeping the fire ablaze. And that's the reason we sang the cross, uh, the song in the cross, near the cross. Because the cross is the altar on which Jesus was uh, offered as a sacrifice so that we can be ushered into life in the spirit. And life in the spirit demands that we keep the fire of God burning in our lives. Hallelujah. So we'll be reading from uh, Leviticus chapter number 6, verse number 12 to verse number 13. And then Leviticus chapter number 10, verse number 1 to verse number 2. John chapter number 4, verse number 23 to 24. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1 and verse number 11. Keeping the fire ablaze. Keeping the fire of God ablaze in our lives. Uh, do we have an uh, audiovisual team with the scriptures uh, on the PowerPoint, please? Okay, let's go. Okay, that's verse number 12. Verse number 12, the Bible says the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. Leviticus chapter number 10, verse number 1 to verse number 2. Verse number one, and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers and put fire in them and added incense, and they offered an authorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his commands. So the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. John chapter number four, verse number 23 to verse number 24. God is spirit. Let's go to verse number 23. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshippers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are such kind of worshippers the Father seeks. Let's go to Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1 and then verse number 11. Romans chapter number 12. All right, Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1, it says, Therefore, okay, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse number 11 of the same chapter. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in the spirit, serve the Lord. Other version says, do not... Uh, let the fire go out. Keep the fire of God alive in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious heavenly Father, we thank you for you're the one that provides the fire. Lord, we're here this morning that you set us on fire. Maybe there's some of us that are on the path of backsliding. Some of us are losing the zeal that we used to have. This morning, I pray by your mercy and your grace that may you rekindle that fire in the name of Jesus Christ. Be glorified in the sharing of this word. In the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to begin by saying that we have a responsibility to create space for the fire of God in our lives. And also we have a responsibility to service the altar, to service the fire. The work of salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not out of our works. And so salvation, the cross of Jesus, opens us into a new reality of life in the spirit. But life in the spirit does not guarantee that we live carelessly. Life in the spirit also has responsibilities on our part. We have to keep the fire of God burning in our lives. 
Some of us, God has called us. Some of us, God has given us deposits of his grace, many kinds of deposits of his grace. We have the responsibility to take care of that deposit. We have the responsibility to keep the fire burning in our lives because anytime we tend to neglect the fire, it goes out. This is why God taught, you know, the priests that the fire in the presence of the Lord must never go out. The key issue is that the fire is provided by God himself. And the reason that God has provided the fire, God demands that we must keep the fire burning. The passages we've read mostly refer to the Old Testament, talking about the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. We are no longer required to offer sacrifices like them. Now we're offering spiritual worship or spiritual service as we've read in the book of John and also in the book of uh, Romans. But again, since we're talking about sacrifice, some of the principles that were applicable then are still applicable now. For instance, in Romans, it says we must present ourselves as acceptable sacrifices. In the Old Testament, God would say we must present sacrifices without blemish. And now he's saying we must present sacrifices that are acceptable and holy. And so there are things that we must do as we present our worship to God. We must do certain things in order to keep the fire of God burning in our lives. And John says, you know, the hour is coming when true, the worshipers of God must be worshipers in truth and in spirit. So our worship before God must be undergirded by the truth of the word of God. It must be in spirit. It is nothing to do with our works. It is about our relationship with the spirit of God. Because being born again is a relationship that comes as we get to connect with the spirit of a living God. And so, as much as the sacrificial system is all gone, once again, some of the principles are what we want to share this morning. We want to apply them in our daily lives. We want to apply them in the New Testament context and see how we can keep the fire of God burning in our lives. And I know that many of us have got testimonies of our glorious past. Once again, we need not to live in the glory of the past. We can get the fire burning right now. This is the reason why we want to talk about rekindling the fire of God now. None of us should end up with stories like I used to be hot in the Lord years back. I used to do this when I was young. But the time is now that we can say that I am on fire for God today and now. And afterwards, we'll have time just to pray and ask God to rekindle the fire. As we talk about this altar and the fire at the altar, three elements at the altar two years ago, I think we had talked about the seminar Easter conference. And Dr. Alicia specifically talked about the altar on the fire. We have this altar, we have this fire, and then we have the sacrifice. But this morning, we want to concentrate on the fire and the fire that God provides. And God says in Leviticus chapter number 6, verse number 12, that this fire must be kept burning. Now, what is an altar? An altar is a place of an encounter with God, where you deliberately set up an environment where you want to encounter God. Now, God is present everywhere. He can decide to visit us at any time. But when talking about order, we're talking about intentionality, where you decide to set up an environment that you need to encounter God. And many times God would demand people in the Old Testament to put up an altar so that God would come through a fire and consume the sacrifice that was presented before, uh, before the altar. Again, this all was pointing out to the ultimate altar of Calvary, Jesus Christ coming to die on the cross. The Bible says he was once, oh, Jesus Christ was offered as a once and for all offering so that you and me can no longer, uh, are no longer required to offer sacrifices. But Jesus Christ as a high priest has opened the door, the doorway into the heavens that you and me can access the throne of God. And so, as we enter into this throne of God, as we enter into this temple of God, the rendering that we see in the Old Testament is still applicable where the fire of God must be burning in our lives. And shortly I'll talk about the symbolism in the fire. Talk about what the symbol of the fire is. When we get access to this fire of God, living indifferent is something that we must all avoid. Living carelessly after we become born again is something that we must all run away from because that will fizzle out the fire. We have a duty and a responsibility to take care of the fire of God that is burning in our lives. Today we have many kinds of Christians that move from one church to another seeking where it is hot, seeking where the fire is burning. As much as it is a corporate responsibility to keep the fire of the Lord burning, I want to submit that it is also much more your personal responsibility to keep the fire of God burning in your life. Actually, God can use your life to light up the environment where you are. Where you think it's called when you are available before God and allow the fire of God to burn in your life. It is you that can act as a catalyst to draw others to the fire of God that they too can continue to service at the altar and keep the fire burning. 
So ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I came with a word of encouragement that we too can rekindle the fire if the fire has been going out. We no longer need to hope from one church to that prophet, to that fellowship, going this way, seeking for the fire. The fire is available right here and today now. We can pray and ask God to bring that fire and revive us one more time. And certainly the Lord today will do something good this morning in the lives of others, some people here today as God rekindles that fire again. We need to be on fire for God. We cannot afford to be cold. We cannot afford to be people that are careless in the presence of the Lord. Because as we see later on, even in the presence of the Lord where we experience his goodness and his presence, there is also judgment. And so we have a responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, to keep the fire of God burning in our lives. As we talk about a personal application, the fire of God, we're looking at a life on fire is a life that is zealous for God. A life that is sold out to the cause of the gospel. Somebody who has a fire of God burning in their lives is somebody who is sold out to do God's will. And so if we're the kind of people that do not follow God's will, if we're the kind of people that are doing as we wish and as we please, something is wrong about the fire of God. Either it is going down or it is already fizzled out. This is the reason that we came to send this reminder that we must set ourselves on fire again and allow God to rekindle the fire in us. Now, what is special about this fire of God? The symbolism in the fire. Like I said two years ago in the a series on the Easter conference, we talked about the fire at the altar. I want to begin by saying that the fire and the presence of God, okay, the fire symbolizes the power and the presence of God. As we're talking about the fire of God, we're talking about his presence in us. When God says, you know, the fire at the altar must be kept burning, it means that the presence of God in your life must never get out. The fire of God in your life must never become cold. You must always be sensitive to the presence and the fire that burns at the altar, the fire of God in your life. Again, the symbolism in the fire. The fire of God also represents the leadership of God. Talking about the children of Israel as they traveled in the wilderness, God was leading them by a pillar of fire. Again, that symbolizes the leadership of God. We must never neglect the leadership of the presence of God in our lives. This is the reason why the fire must be kept burning. When the fire goes down, We'll go our way. We'll get lost because God is no longer leading us. The fire of God alludes to the holiness of God. Fire is a purifier. And so as we talk about keeping the fire of God this morning, we want to encourage and exhort you once again that we need to go back on the path of holiness. You know, when Moses came in the presence of the Lord and he saw this burning bush, God says, stay there for where you are standing is holy ground. Where the fire of the Lord is, there is holiness. It is a pure ground. And therefore, this is a reminder to, call, a reminder to holiness this morning. Again, the fire of God also denotes judgment. Deuteronomy chapter number 4, verse number 24. The Bible says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And Hebrews were also told that our God is a consuming fire. He judges and he still judges even today. It is just out of his mercies that we are not consumed by his judgments. But God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. The last application I want to make in the symbolism of the fire is that the fire of God represents the Holy Spirit. The fire of God symbolizes the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that burns inside of us. Pentecost is associated with fire. And so as Pentecostals, as believers, we got the fire of God in us that has to be kept burning. It must be left ablaze always. We must never let the fire go out. So being on fire for God means you're walking in the direction and in the promptings of the Holy Spirit, in the direction and the promptings of the Lord our God. The fire, the presence of God, the fire must be kept burning. Is your fire burning this morning? Is your fire burning this morning? I want us to talk about a few things about our service at the altar and the fire, and then we'll talk about applications in our personal life. The first thing, reading back into the Old Testament, the passages we've read from Leviticus. Number one, the first thing that we want to talk about is that, you know, God had commanded the priests that every morning they should come into, at the altar and take out the ashes and bring fresh firewood. We must bring fresh supplies every time to the altar. We must bring fresh supplies every time. We must bring fuel to the altar every time. The fire is supposed to constantly burn. Whatever it takes to keep the fire burning, 
in your life, the fire of God burning in your life, we must never get tired. This was a command. The fire must be constantly kept ablaze every morning. So this is regardless of whether you're on holiday, but you must keep the fire burning. Whether you're tired, you must bring fresh supplies to keep the fire of God burning because the fire is the Lord. God supplies the fire. We supply the firewood. God supplies the spirit. We open up inside. So this is the reason that as believers, every time we come to the Lord in his presence in prayer, we ask for the fire of God, we ask of the Holy Spirit, and we open up our hearts so that God can fill us with his spirit. Because every time God needs us to open up so that the fire can be kept burning. We have to prepare for a place of an encounter with God. As I said earlier, God can meet us at any point, but it takes intentionality for us to need and to desire to meet with God. The Bible says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. That's intentionality. That's setting up a place for an encounter with God. That's setting up an altar where the fire of God must burn. Setting up an altar for the fire of God to burn. And once the fire is alighted, once the fire has been kindled by God, our responsibility is to make sure that this fire continues to burn. Naturally, any fire that is not adequately supplied will die. And probably that's where some of us are here today this morning. Reason we live in the glory of the past is because the fire is dying out. We're not supplying fresh supplies. We're not putting firewood at the altar so that the fire of God can burn. God spoke to you, yes, clearly. You have a testimony. Clearly, God spoke to you in a mighty way. But yet, we need to keep that fire alive by bringing fresh supplies. That's the first thing about our service at the altar, supplying the firewood to the altar. The second thing, providing an acceptable sacrifice. A well-prepared altar without a sacrifice is meaningless. You can prepare a beautiful altar waiting for God to bring up the fire. But if there is no sacrifice, then I think it's futile. And I believe we're all here because we all want to have an encounter with God. I got born again when I was 26 years old. But all along I'd been a member of this church, Assemblies of God. And for sure I was coming to church, presenting myself before the altar. But there was no fire. There was no sacrifice. And I know that it is possible to do that. There are some of us that have come to church because you're just following someone. You've come to church to the altar where you want the fire of God to burn, but you have no sacrifice. This is the reason now in Romans it says we must present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We must present ourselves holy before God as a living sacrifice. Yes, we have done right to come to church, but we must seek the fire of God. We do right to seek the Lord, but we must present ourselves as sacrifices. We must present ourselves as holy and acceptable sacrifices. I want to remind you that everything about us is worship. Everything about us, my job, my career, my marriage is worship. And therefore, I have no choice to choose what I present before God as a sacrifice. Everything about us is worship. So some of us want to present this sacrifice before God at our convenience. We choose what to sacrifice before God. Yes, it must be holy, but we must remember that we must present ourselves as living sacrifice. All of ourselves, all of our being as living sacrifices. So there is nothing like, you know, you present just your Sunday before God. Everything about our lives must be a living sacrifice that is acceptable before God. The altar without the sacrifice means nothing. And so is the altar without the fire. And so we must prepare and be ready to encounter God. Preparation is very important. Prepare the altar, prepare the sacrifice. Never be the kind of sacrifice that wants to be a sacrifice when it is convenient. The third thing that we want to look at this morning, in Genesis chapter number 15, we have a story of Abraham. God had told him, Abraham, prepare a place for a sacrifice, and then you come and sacrifice. In Genesis chapter number 15, when Abraham had prepared the sacrifice, the Bible says, you know, this was before the fire of God had come to consume the sacrifice. Abraham began, okay, birds of prey began to circle around the sacrifice. And Abraham began to chase the birds of prey. I want to submit that one of the things in our responsibility as we present ourselves as sacrifices before God is to watch out for the vouchers. Watch out for the birds of prey. The moment you're waiting at the altar, waiting for the fire of God, There'll be vultures coming, circulating around, trying to get a part of the sacrifice you've prepared for God. Your sacrifice is meant for God, not for vouchers. Hallelujah. 
That's the reason we have many that started well on this journey, presenting themselves as living sacrifices, only to end up as a sacrifice for vouchers. You started on fire for God, but greed has taken over. It is greed that is consuming the sacrifice and not the fire of God. You started well on this journey of Christianity, seeking the face of God and being on fire for God, only to end up with the love and the unholy pursuit of money consuming us. This morning I have a question, what is consuming our sacrifice? I pray that you must make sure that it is God that will consume our sacrifice. This is the reason we started by saying everything about us must be worship. We must not divorce part of us, part of our things from our worship. Everything about us makes meaning when we present it as a sacrifice before God. And so the many stories of people we've heard that they used to be a heart on fire, to be on fire for God and things were... What has gone wrong? The issue is about what has consumed the sacrifice. So maybe we're presenting sacrifices that are contaminated by vouchers. So you've been praying for your marriage, presenting it before God as a, as a sacrifice. Vouchers would come smartly dressed with just simple invitations to dinner. Make sure you don't get consumed by the vouchers. Make sure that your marriage is still presented before God as a sacrifice. You've been seeking God for intervention, for prayer answered. You've been looking from God and you've been waiting and waiting. And like Abraham, you're at a point when you're tired. You keep on chasing the vouchers. And the fire is not yet here. This morning, I want to encourage you, keep on waiting. Keep on waiting. Keep on chasing the vouchers until God brings his own fire. Until God brings his own fire. At a point, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 15, verse number 17, when the sun had got down and uh, uh, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces that Abraham had prepared. After the sun had gone down, he had been there, I don't know from when, waiting and chasing the vouchers. When he was tired, the Bible says there was this fiery gloom of darkness around and he was almost dozing and sleeping. And that's when the fire of God appeared. Maybe some of us are giving too much, are giving up too early. So don't give up this morning as you're presenting yourself. You've been on this place waiting for God, present, doing all the best that you can do to be that sacrifice before God. I pray and we'll be praying for you at the end of the service that you continue to keep the focus. Keep on chasing the vouchers. Keep on chasing the beds of prayer. Your sacrifice is meant for God. Your sacrifice is not meant for the vouchers. May the Lord help us all. And so sometimes as we keep waiting, waiting and waiting, the temptation is to bring your own fire. That's point number four. Do not bring your own fire. Do not bring your own fire. Do not bring your own fire. The fire of God is irreplaceable. You can't substitute the fire of God for anything. Neither can you trade it for anything. I know that's what we do many times, but it's just that we are careless. The fire of God cannot be replaced for anything. Skill cannot replace the fire of God. The fire of God is irreplaceable. So regardless of how familiar we get to the fire, never treat it with contempt. We have seen it in Leviticus chapter number 10. The sons of Aaron tried to bring their own fire and they were consumed by the fire of God. Our God is a pure God, he's a holy God, but he's also a God who judges. So you can't come in the presence of the Lord and begin to treat him with contempt. Deliberately, when you know for sure this is what God demands you do otherwise deliberately, the fire of God may end up consuming us. Do not exchange the fire of God with your own fire. So you and me as ministers before God, God has called us that we can minister in his fire, continue to service at the altar. Never must we replace the fire of God with our own fire. It is God's fire and therefore must be handled by the protocols established by God himself. So this morning, some of us need to take a step back and look seriously into our lives. Where are we? Are we sure it's the fire of God burning in our lives? Or probably some of us are saying, yes, it's the fire of God. But then you've been noticing that somehow I'm losing the fire. I'm losing the direction. The zeal that you had is almost now fizzling out. This morning, we'll have time to pray and rekindle that fire. And for some of us that are on fire for God, it's just a warning to say, a caution. May we forever keep in check that the fire of God is burning in our lives. It might be applicable to us. It might not be applicable to us today. But maybe a point in time will come when we'll see that this fire is going out. We must make sure that that fire never goes out. 
Never replace the fire of God with your effort. Never replace the fire of God with your works. Allow the fire of God to be the fire of God. Never replace it with money. Never replace it with them. Let the fire of God burn in our lives. Number five. This is from the New Testament. First Thessalonians chapter number five, verse number 19. Do not quench the spirit. Again, just quenching has an import of quenching the fire. Do not quench the spirit of God. Neglecting our service at the altar leads to the fire of God dying out. So last week we were exhorted on the voice of the spirit. The need to heed to the voice of the spirit. One of the sure ways to let the fire of God burn out in our lives is when we disobey the voice of the spirit. So walking in disobedience is one sure way to quench the fire of the spirit. So some of us, God has been talking to us. God has been directing us. I pray we have the boldness to obey him. We have the courage to obey what God in direction is giving us. Because without that, the fire is going to die out in our lives. So don't despise the spirit of God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the fire of the Holy Spirit. Do not stifle the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. One of the ways you can keep the fire of God burning as regards the Holy Spirit is to allow yourself to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. A few years ago, as we talk about Pentecost, we prayed for the gifts of the Spirit. One of the ways, sure ways to make sure you're on fire for God is when you allow yourself to walk in these gifts of the Spirit. As God is prompting you to pray for the sick, pray for the sick. As God is telling you to do certain things, do those things because that's one way you keep your consciousness that the fire of God is ablaze in your life. We must keep the fire of God burning in our lives, ladies and gentlemen. The New Testament church, as you read, time and again, they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled and refilled again. Because the fire must always be burning. Filled and refilled again. And this morning, we can pray again that God fill us again. Set us on fire again. Because the fire comes from God. And that's the fire of the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. So this morning, as we're in here, maybe some of us have been asking ourselves questions. What is it that God has been demanding? I pray you give space to God to speak freely with you. And when he's demanding you for you to make certain decisions, you must make certain decisions. At the end of this service, we make a choice. Some of us will make new and fresh commitments about keeping the fire of the Lord. Some of us will make decisions that we made years past, but we have long, you know, abandoned them. We must rekindle the fire of God in our lives. So number one, bring fresh supplies. Number two, bring an acceptable sacrifice. Number three, watch out for the vultures. Number four, don't replace it with the fire. And number five, do not quench the fire of the spirit. I want us to apply it in our modern day walk with Christ. And I'm going again basic, talking about the basic disciplines of Christian walk. I just want to relate the fire of God with the basic disciplines that uh, you and me are supposed to walk in as believers. Every time people come to the Lord, most of the times we tend to encourage them. We tell them, ah, you must pray. You must read the word. Those are the very basic things. I want us to relate them to the fire of God and see how best we can ignite the fire of God in our lives. And so for some of us, this will be a place of assessment. For some of us, we must gauge ourselves. Where am I in terms of prayer? Where am I in terms of reading the word? Where am I in terms of my uh, devotion to the church? Number one, we talk about the fire of God and prayer. Prayer is one significant way to keep ourselves spiritually vibrant. One of the easiest indicators to know that the fire is dying out is when you cease to pray. When you begin to justify your lack of prayerlessness. That's one of the easy indicators to know that you're on the path of backsliding. That's one of the easy indicators to know that the fire of God is going out. You used to go to the mountain to pray. You used to fast and pray. Today you can justify that God hears anywhere. I can pray in my blankets. God will hear. Yes, it's correct. He can hear your prayers in your blankets. But there is something that is dying out and you can't see it. You can't just notice it. Hallelujah. Yeah, sometimes we come to a point of saying, yes, God answers even by prayer without fasting. Yes, it's correct. But that's a slide. You know for sure that you're sliding back from the time you used to be on fire for God. The things that you used to pray for, today you no longer pray for them because you've gotten used to them. You no longer depend on God. You no longer need God. 
This morning, I want to encourage the church once again to go back to that upper room, to the place of prayer, to the place where we can be on fire for God, truly depending on God to preserve the fire that is ignited in our lives. Second Chronicles chapter number 7, verse number 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Every time we pray, the glory of God comes in our midst. Every time we pray, the fire of God comes in our lives. So prayer is one sure path to keeping the fire of God ablaze in our lives. So today I came to remind somebody that you need to be focused on prayer. You need to make a commitment to prayer. So some of us, we need to join the intercessory prayer team in this church because that will offer you a place of accountability. You know, sometimes when you want to pray on your own, I mean, you have no accountability. You can decide when to pray. You want to pray when you're sleeping and then you realize it's morning. But when you have friends that can push and ask, brother, it's time to pray. This is an hour of prayer. Sometimes you get encouraged. So this morning, I want to encourage some of us that we need to have friends that are going to hold our hands as we light up the fire of God in prayer. Our problem is we want to pray like them when we are not like them. Hannah could not pray like Penina. Their challenges were different. So you want to pray like that other person whose challenges are different from you. We must take an assessment of our lives and see where we are and make decisions that are personal that are going to help us be on fire for God. The fire of God and prayer. Presence is, is a big disease in the church. It's just that we live in denial most of the times. We live in denial most of the times about our lack of presence. But I pray that the Lord this morning will convict us by his spirit that we can rejuvenate our prayer lifestyles again. Let the fire burn through our prayer rooms. Let there be prayer altars in our homes. Let there be prayer altars in our families, in our, in our workplaces. Let there be prayer altars in this church. Wherever you go, create space for prayer. Create space for an encounter with God. The fire of God and prayer. The second discipline that I want us to look at is the fire of God and the word of God. There is a strong connection between the word of God and the fire of God. Neglecting the word of God is a sure path to error. When you begin to lose sight of the word of God, when you begin to, you know, to push aside the word of God, that's a sure path to destruction. That's a sure path to error. We need a fresh word of God every day. So ladies and gentlemen, we must love to read the word of God. We must find that space again in our lives to read the word of God. It doesn't matter whether you've read it before from Genesis to Revelation. Every time we must be people that are soaked in the word. Allow God to speak to us in his word each and every day of our lives. God reveals himself through his word. We encounter God through his word. Some of us are where we are today in challenges and failing to cope with the issues of life because we have neglected the word of God. Jeremiah chapter number 20, verse number 9. Jeremiah is at a place where he feels confused. He feels God has cheated him. He feels that things are not going in the right direction. And then he says, I think, let me just leave this stuff. This proclaiming and this prophetic stuff, can I leave it? But this is what the Bible says in Jeremiah 20, verse number 9. Jeremiah says, but his word is like fire shut up in my bones. I am aware of holding it, and indeed I cannot. The word of God burns like fire in our bones. When we hold on to the word of God, it burns like, I mean, we come to a place where we're almost giving up and the word of God is burning and pushing us further. Go further, go further. You cannot quit, you cannot quit. And so Jeremiah, when he's at the point of quitting, the word of God is burning that he can't even withhold it. I pray that would be the state of our lives. Where we are so soaked with the word of God that when challenges come our way and we're at a point of quitting, the word of God burns to the extent that we we have no other choice but to keep on moving, keep on moving, keep on moving because we have the word of God in us. So ladies and gentlemen, this morning, don't neglect the study and the reading of the word of God. It fires up the fire of God inside of us. At a point, the devil says it's time to commit suicide. The word of God says you will live to declare the goodness of the Lord. So somebody is depressed this morning. Go back to the scriptures and find what God says about your season and your situation. Don't give up yet. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Allow the fire of God to burn in your life and allow the word of God to give you fresh action. You'll be able to move forward. Like Jeremiah, you say, I'm aware of holding the word of God in my heart. And so I'll keep on proclaiming 
regardless of the distractions, regardless of the disturbances that are out there. The word of God and the fire of God. The third thing, the third application, the word of God and the pursuit of holiness. Remember we talked about the fire of God representing the holiness of God. Sin is one of the issues that can keep out the fire of God in our lives. Actually, most of us don't have the fire of God in our life because we have allowed, we have nurtured sin, we have hidden sin, we have sin that we have not confessed, we are, we are, we are not handling well sin. Sin must not be handled casually. Abihu and not, the sons of Aaron, they were consumed in the presence of the Lord because of going contrary to the word of God. They sinned before God and God consumed them. And so if issues of holiness are beginning to bother you, check the level of the fire of God in your life. You know, sometimes you come to a place when people begin to talk about holiness, you're feeling like, wow, they are holier than thou. I mean, how dare he just talks about holiness? Before you begin to push the word of God away, I think it's time to begin to look inside and begin to see if the fire is indeed burning. It could be that the fire is already out. That's why you become uncomfortable in talking about issues of holiness. May the Lord help us. The fire of God purifies us. The fire of God enables us to be holy. And when the hunger for holiness is diminishing, watch out. The fire of God is a constant reminder of his holiness, that we too are to be separated from anything that is impure. Very basic to our Christian walk, the pursuit of holiness. We keep the fire of God burning in our lives by the pursuit of holiness. The fire of God and community. The fire of God and fellowship. The fire of God and fellowship. Individually, we are at the temple of God. Collectively, we are also the temple of God. And in this temple, the fire of God must be burning. This is the reason Elia talked about, you know, you seeking the fire in congregations or maybe in places. But again, you must always remember that you too are a temple of God where the fire must be burning. God demands fellowship, just like he demanded fellowship in the Old Testament. We make ourselves venerable when we run away from people. So this is me now, a cell pastor, trying to encourage the church. There are some of our friends that are not welcoming us into their homes. Don't give up on them because they become more vulnerable the more they stay away from you. Our sales and fellowship provide a place of accountability. So you must never run away from people that are coming to check on you. They have good intentions. They're coming with supplies for the fire. So it's not like they're encroaching your private space. They're not. They're doing you good. COVID has done us a lot of harm in this church, even beyond. We have talked about failing to reboot from COVID. Most of our friends have stayed, I mean, where they were during COVID times and not even coming back to church. That's the more reason that you and me must keep the fire of God burning through fellowship. We must encourage the gathering together of saints. You and me must be people that always encourage others to come into the presence of God. This is the reason why some of you, if you're not in church, I would dare ask you, I didn't see you in church. It's just to make sure that you are on fire for God. As a look in the epistles of Paul, Talking about fellowship, it's not like we have, uh, you know, these ministers in the audience. It talks about collaborative ministry. We are co-workers. We are people that work together. We participate in Christ together. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you and me are all supposed to be workers in the kingdom. You're not supposed to be here just to warm the benches. There is a place for you at the Lord's table here for you to do something in the kingdom. So none of us must be a bench warmer. None of us must just be a spectator. God has called us to do different, different roles in the church. What is the difference is the roles that we play, but we all have a part to play. So some of us could have a, play to play, uh, a part to play like I'm standing here, but some of you have got very significant roles. Some of you are intercessors that God is raising so that this church can be on fire. Don't neglect that. That's your part that God has called you. So that the fire of God can, pick, can keep on burning in our fellowship. The fire of God is kept ablaze through reverent and dedicated service. And so I want to submit that there is nothing like being on fire for God outside the body of Christ. There is nothing like being on fire for God outside the body of Christ. You can't. It's not possible. If you're on fire, we'll see it in the body of believers as you minister and serve the Lord through his people. 
the fire of God and fellowship. And the last thing, the fire of God and evangelism, the burden for the lost. The fire of God is what ignites revivals. The fire of God is what grows the burden for the lost. Combining this issue of fellowship and evangelism, I have a friend who is in Botswana, and many times he calls me, he says, Pastor, what are you doing this month for evangelism? I'm sending fuel. You go preach. It's not like I'm employed. I'm not employed. Maybe it's not like part-time for this. But this guy is just there as a consciousness, as a reminder. That's the power of fellowship and the power of keeping the, uh, the fire of God at work through evangelism. Every time you go out to preach, I mean, you're ready. You're prepared. You see the works of God. You see God working out miracles. And you realize that, oh, I have the fire and the presence of God in me. So there is nothing like being on fire for God without reaching out to the Lord. Something is wrong if you're on fire for God and you're keeping the fire to yourself. The fire will not be contained, just like in the case of Jeremiah. He had to go out. He had to go out. He was aware of holding the fire of God, that, the word of God that was burning like fire in his, in, in his heart and in his bones. There is a strong connection between evangelism, the burden for the lost, and the fire of God. So one of the indicators that you're losing the fire of God is your passion for the lost is dying down. That's one clear indicator that you're losing the fire. You used to preach. You used to tell people about Christ. You used to be concerned. You'd see drunkards on the streets and you'd feel sorry for them and begin to pray for them. Today you walk past them and nothing happens in your heart. Something is going wrong. The fire is dying down. May the Lord help us. May the Lord give us grace. I'll call the praise team to come to the front so that we can pray and rekindle the fire. The applications remember the fire of God and prayer. Prayer is one significant way to rekindle the fire of God. The fire of God and the word of God. There is a strong connection between the word of God and the fire of God. The fire of God and the pursuit of holiness. We must always be people that are reverent of God because of his holiness. The fire of God keeps us awake to the consciousness that God is holy and that we must be holy as well. The fire of God and fellowship. Never neglect the gathering together of saints. Never neglect church. Never neglect checking up on others because that's how we keep the fire ablaze. The fire of God and reaching out to the lost. Make sure that you're always on fire for God as you reach out and tell others about this fire. Once again, the passage we started with, Leviticus chapter number 6, verse number 12, the fire must be kept burning. It must continuously burn. This morning, we'll be praying shortly. And uh, here are my prayer petitions as we pray this morning. Number one, I want to pray for the category of people that have lost the fire. You know for sure this fire is no longer there. Or probably the fire is about to die down. You have seen indicators, early warning signals that the fire is about to go. Or maybe you have exchanged this fire with your own fire. I pray the Lord will convict. I pray that the Lord will set us on fire again this morning. And I want to pray for those that are making a fresh commitment this morning to say, God, I want to be on fire for you again. I want to join the intercessory team. I want to join the missions team. I want to walk on this path of purity and holiness. I want to be active again and serve in church. Maybe you're here this morning. May God set you on fire so that he grants you the desires of your heart. The last category of group people I want to pray for. Praying for strength and grace for those that have been at the altar. Presenting their sacrifices. The fire of God is not yet there. But the vultures keep on circling around the sky. Continue to watch out my brother. Continue to watch out my sister. Continue to wait on the Lord. One day is one, the Lord will provide the fire. The day is coming, the Lord will answer that prayer. The Lord will answer that prayer. Keep on hanging. Meanwhile, keep on chasing the vouchers away. Praise Him will lead us in prayer, uh, in singing, and then we can come to pray again. We can all stand as we sing this song together. Yes, let's stand. Peace like a river, love like a mountain, the wind of your spirit is blowing everywhere.
prayer this morning. If you need prayer, you need to be set on fire again, the altar is open. But we want to go to the Lord as a prayer one more time. The Lord set us on fire again. Rekindle the fire again. Come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer as the praise team continues to sing. Riba kashatetea, hande kosaterebe. In the blessed name of Jesus, oh gracious heavenly Father, we pray. Rekindle the fire again in our lives. Uh. Rekindle the fire again in our lives. Uh. Rekindle the fire again in our lives. Rebe, shara da bo sada baba. Eke rebe sata baba. Baba shika ya ba. Rebe ke sete rebe rebe. Masada babo ya. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. Ask God to set us on fire. Set us on fire, oh God. Set us on fire. Set us on fire. Set us on fire. Set us on fire. Set us on fire, Lord. Raba baba. Eke te ke rebe shara baba baba baba. Raba baba raba bo. Rebe 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 rebe. Raba baba baba raba baba baba baba. Rebe rebe rebe. Raba baba shata kai. Eke te ke te ke rebe rebe. Set us on fire, oh God. 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 Set us on fire. Heavenly Father, forgive us for exchanging your fire with our fire. Forgive us, oh God, that we have neglected service at the altar. We have neglected the discipline of prayer. We have neglected the pursuit of holiness. Forgive us, oh God. Ah, forgive us, oh God, because of lost fire for the lost, burden for the lost. Forgive us, oh God, set us on fire again. May we be kind of people that are on fire again for you in the name of Jesus. Ah, revive us again. Rekindle the fire again. Rekindle the fire again. Let the fire burn again for those of us that are distressed, depressed. Let your word burn like fire in our hearts and in our bones. Rababo shande kerebe be santa baba. Hande kerebo sata kababoya. Maze karado shanta baba. In the blessed name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, your fire again, your fire again. Rekindle us, O oh God, give us your fire again, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless you and we worship you. If you're here, you're sick. You're making a fresh commitment. Just raise your hand as we pray together and wrapping up the service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for every hand that is raised this morning, making a fresh commitment to the disciplines of Christian walk. Lord, I pray for grace and strength in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Now, Lord, as we wrap up, I pray for those that are sick, heal them. Those that need an encounter with you at every point, in their life, Lord, I pray for grace. I pray for strength. May you do it according to your grace and your purposes. In the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. The preceding program was sponsored by the goodwill, prayers, and financial resources of the Heritage Partners.
Your glory 